Okay, uh, just gonna say hello to everybody and welcome you to the X Team Identity Video Day. Um, we've got a very special um, presentation today on um, from sorry uh, from uh, community X Team member Daniel Mather, who's been exploring um, logging with DID. Um, so. I'm not going to beat about the bush and I'll just hand over to you and thank you. All yours. All right. All right. Awesome. So hello from my side. Uh, I'm Daniel and uh, I've been playing with IOTA identity in combination with existing protocols uh, such as OAuth and OpenID Connect, which make up the current state of the internet in terms of authentication and authorization. Uh, and I'm pretty sure most of you have already used that in the past multiple times. Is this classical login with Google, login with Facebook, login with GitHub, you name it. And um, yeah, also companies use that. They have their own uh, authentication system running and you can do a single sign on uh, through these systems. And what you can see here, I quickly drew a little, like a little chart here, how it usually looks like uh, in terms of the information information exchange, the flow. This is a very, very stripped down version. So everybody knowing OAuth would probably kill me at this point, but uh, I just want to make it as simple as possible for you to understand what's actually happening and what I implemented in the past few months, I would say. So usually you have a client, which is a shop or a website, and uh, that client, um, so you as a person are not the client in that case, um, but the client, uh, technically speaking, is the app that tries to access your data. Um, and that client asks an identity provider, for example, Google, who knows who you are, you log in with Google, et cetera, um, about your information so they can use it. Um, on your behalf. The big advantage of this is that you don't have to provide your an additional username, password, email, et cetera, verify that email with that client, but the client trusts the identity provider and uh, the identity provider manages your data. So you as a user, you store all your personal information with this identity provider, but you have the advantage of this identity provider usually being super secure. Um, Google, in terms of security, is uh, pretty strong. But the drawback is the identity provider has all your information at all times and is the trusted third party in that example. There is also, if, if you want to set up a system stuff like that, that also enterprise, uh, enterprises use um, would be Keycloak, which is an open source identity and access management system. Uh, I run a local instance here and you can see that you have different clients you could set up and user management, et cetera. I don't have any users in the database right now, so this is clear, um, so no user has registered with my identity provider here. And I'm also running a little client shop website here. So I basically um, set up both these systems locally to demonstrate everything. So yeah, but what have I done now? So Keycloak allows you to implement plugins uh, and extend Keycloak's uh, basic functionality. And that's exactly what I did. I wrote a plugin or, a, or an extension in that regard that understands if you post uh, verifiable credentials to it, verifies them with the tangle to see if they're valid, and then injects the user information from that, um, from that uh, credential into a standard compliant user that's used in the self-hosted identity provider. So from the client's perspective, the shop or the website, nothing changes. 
they just talk to the identity provider, the identity provider gives them the information, but you as a person that, that controls the identity doesn't post the, the, the information directly or stores it directly with the identity provider, but has it verified by the Tangle. This essentially uh, takes away the, the, the storing of information by the identity provider and you have it in your hands again. The thing is you still have to trust the identity provider to, uh, the identity provider to not store your information, but as it's my extension, you have to, you can look at the code and see that the extension does not store anything. It is still persisted in the identity provider's database, but you can request access for deletion after a certain amount of time. So the identity provider would forget everything about you and you would have to re-authenticate to be able to use the client application again. Um, yeah. What this allows us to do is to actually bridge the whole Tangle DID, verifiable credential, verifiable presentation world to the existing OAuth OpenID Connect world. In its final form, I would say that we get rid of the identity provider in, in general and only have clients, the Tangle, and us users with the wallets. But that also implies that all clients, all shops, all websites implement IOTA identity with them um, talking to the Tangle, which will, as we all know, happen at one point. <laughs> um, hopefully. So yeah, but this is this is in more of like a, a intermediary solution um, while while we're not there yet. I also have to mention that this is not fully decentralized. I mean, the Tangle can and will be fully decentralized, but the identity provider is still one entity. Um, it might be distributed across across different machines but it's still a central party that we cannot get rid of uh, if we don't want to break the client implementation. So let's see it in action, <clears throat> how it will look like. So we don't have any users in here. Uh, it's still empty. And we want to go to our client now, which is a basic view app. And there it is, login with IOTA. So once I click that, I get redirected to the identity provider, which wants information from me. So um, now I can scan this QR code with my identity wallet um, and I will be logged in. Um, as I did not implement a full-fledged identity wallet that runs on mobile that you can scan QR codes with, or I mean, I tried, but I failed miserably. I uh, implemented a quick um, and small identity CLI wallet. Let me make this a little bigger so you can see it better, which is which essentially essentially does the same thing. So it signs a credential with my data in it and posts it to the identity provider, which is the same that the app would do if I had something implemented like that. So <clears throat> you can see you have different options here. You can have verbose debug output to see what's actually happening. You can initialize the wallet with a predefined uh, JSON object that contains, um, that contains uh, some, some DIDs that I have in my, in my store. You can also reset the state obviously and uh, you can also provide a challenge, which we are going to do. So if I just run it by itself, no arguments, it says IOTA identity CLI wallet. Um, one word of advice here, this is only for testing. So you cannot use this in any production environments because it stores your keys uh, in, in, the, in the JSON. 
so you can reuse it across machines, but it's only for testing purposes. Uh, if you wanted to use this in production or in any other environments, I would strongly suggest to use Stronghold instead, but I didn't bother to implement that. So yeah. So it has ADID in its, in its database, in its JSON, and uh, which also gets resolved uh, to the Tangle to see if it's valid. And uh, I'm now using the SDID. And what the um, identity provider now wants from me is that I sign this challenge here with my DID so it knows how to log me in. So looking at the options, I'm supposed to do it like that. I'm providing a challenge. And what it's doing now, it's uh, creating a login credential that is of the type login with IOTA OIDC, Open ID Connect. You could also just specify login with IOTA. Uh, and uh, I also have a credential, a credential subject in here, which contains first name Jane, last name Doe. And um, after this uh, self-signed credential has been created, uh, a presentation is built from it that contains the challenge. The challenge is important so that the authentication provider, um, the, the identity provider knows that I signed this. Because if I get hold of somebody's uh, credential, they could use it uh, on on in, on my behalf and log in with my uh, with my identity, and we don't want that. So I have to sign it with my wallet. So yeah, it posts the the credential to the identity provider in the background. So if I continue now, I'm logged in. Hello, Jane Doe. I did, I did not put any username, password. I did not specify my email, nothing. And uh, I'm logged in and I can use it now. It also states email verified false, which might be of importance for the client, for the shop, um, because they might want to only have verified emails in their, in their use. Um, but as I did not specify any any email at all, uh, it's just first name last name. And if we go back to the to the identity provider, and I take a look at all the users, I get, I go to view all users again. I can see we have a new entry, Jane Doe, and I can uh, inspect that a little, look at the attributes, and it actually stored it linked my DID that I provided in my credential to my account. And also uh, the wallet automatically um, provides a request for removal to for my data uh, set to be removed entirely. So that key cloak instance would run a task periodically and it would kill this this user account again and I would essentially be forgotten. So yeah, I can continue using the app now. I can log out and also log back in. I didn't have to post another credential again, which is uh, because the identity provider still has my data set. That's the reason for that. So if the request for deletion now takes action, and my data set gets removed again. I log out and I want to log back in. It has forgotten me and I have to do manual sign up again. Why do we persist it at all? Like we could immediately wipe it um, after after uh, the the initial login has been has been completed. We could do that, yes. But the thing is, on each page reload, you would have to log in again. 
because nothing would be persisted in the central instance. And uh, yeah, in terms of user experience, I don't think that's a that's a a, a good idea. So you as a user are in full control if you trust the deletion mechanism of the uh, identity provider here. Um, if you specify, okay, I'm gonna give you my my uh, credential, but please delete it after a certain period. For example, once I once I'm finished uh, using the using the client or the web shop. And you could also always request manual deletion. Like once once I'm done with with browsing the web shop, I could. Uh, um, Tell my wallet, okay, please wipe my wipe my information from that from that uh, identity provider, and it would instantly forget me. So yeah, that's that's that. I think uh, I think that's it. Yeah. <laughs> you say, oh, that's it. That. That's a big deal. That's huge. Um, it's amazing. Um, I'm going to just open the floor up for questions because I'm sure there's a lot. Um, but yeah, wow. Some amazing work, dude. <laughs> Does anybody have any questions? We had a question in the chat. What the verifiable presentation was exactly used for? Oh, it's uh, the presentation is actually posted to the to the identity provider. So it's not the credential itself; it's the presentation because it contains a a proof, a signature, uh, with a challenge. And uh, for for each login process, you would sign the credential, um, with, and and essentially create a different presentation. I mean, here we're creating a credential each time where we're also creating a presentation, but we wouldn't need to do that. I mean, we can have a credential issued by some other trusted third party that has verified our email address, for example, and we can use um, a presentation to sign that credential. So we can basically verify our email that we are the holder of this email address uh, with a third party, like the, you know, the the typical, like, please click this link to verify your email address, et cetera. And they could issue a verifiable credential to us and we can sign that one instead. So the client would know, okay, this email has already been verified. I mean, it's, it's, it's just an idea. You can, you can do tons of things with, with that, but, but yeah. Does that answer the question? <laughs> I'm going to take that as a yes. <laughs> I mean, obviously, the solution here, it needs some polishing, right? I mean, I, tr I tried my very best to, <laughs> to create a nice login with a Yoda button. Uh, and I've seen some some mock-ups recently uh, on Twitter, et cetera, but this is the best I could come up with. But uh, yeah, also this page here, it it can look a little more IOTA-y, kind of. So yeah. I don't think it's about the front end, though. Like the front end, anybody can create. It's the back end that's the important. Yeah. That's, yeah. that's the amazing work you've done. Like anybody, anybody who's who's creating an app or something, they know front end. They can create components. They can make it look pretty. But what you've done in the back end there is just insane. Um, it's what can we say? It, I mean, it's it's not perfect because we know we're not there yet with like zero knowledge proofs and things like that. But yeah. as as an entry point into logging with digital identity where application creators service providers don't even have to change their current system they can just integrate it simply with with an api like that is revolutionary in getting people to adopt 
digital identity into their into their infrastructure. And I think that's that's really important. And what you've done here is just nuts in my mind. Like we're, we're gonna we're gonna start <laughs> using this in everything. <laughs> Yeah, I mean you can you can run your own instance of of, of Keycloak with with the IOTA uh, identity plugin. You can you can host that yourself. So if you have some cloud provider like I don't know Azure, Google, you name it, AWS, you can you can host that yourself. Sign it up with your client and use it right away. So you don't have to trust anybody else. It's just the bridge to standard protocols. That's that's what the entire solution is basically. So yeah. But you have it on your own server, I guess, here, no? I mean, this is, yeah, localhost is my own server, yeah. Yes, okay, so yeah. it's on Linux-based? I mean, the thing is, you can run it everywhere. The, the, the only thing you need, to, you need to make sure is that the client can access it, and the client is configured to ask your hosted solution for the, for the credentials. Um, so let me go back to that page. So what's behind the login with IOTA button is actually, okay, please use this provider to give me uh, user information. And uh, I mean, you can host it yourself if you, run the, if you run the client yourself. So if you have a website, then you wanna integrate login with IOTA there, you can do that and run your own instance. Or, and I'm planning to do that, to have a managed hosted solution somewhere in the cloud which is still centralized, obviously, um, but you can sign up your client there and you don't have to run Keycloak by yourself. Um, yeah, some small like community service kind of, I'm planning to do that, yeah. From, from a adoption perspective, you, you mentioned you have to use a certain service provider who's creating an application like this. Um, would it be possible for people to use in use this system interoperably because of the IOTA infrastructure? What do you mean exactly? I mean which which part do you do you think uh, or like interoperably? I mean if we if we take back like if we take a look at this picture here, so from from a client's perspective, nothing changes, right? So in this view JS up here, it doesn't even know IOTA exists. So it it just knows, okay, I need to speak standard protocol OpenID Connect with with Keycloak. That's it. And from a user's perspective, you sign credentials with a wallet and you post them somewhere. Okay, so that's that's also like the 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 target perspective. Um, I think if if many people like would start using this and say, okay, login with IOTA, we we want a decentralized solution. It would actually put slight pressure on the clients to implement the Tangle version of it and get and, and not ask an identity provider for it, but ask the Tangle directly and verify the credential you post to the page with the Tangle directly. So it's, as you said, it's an intermediary step. Um, nothing changes from the user's perspective. So from, from, from our side, basically. And um, yeah, it's, it's the clients that need to change. So if this client switched to proper plugin with IOTA decentralized version, you as a user would probably not even notice. Love it. <laughs> Just seeing that login with IOTA button and it actually working, it makes me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, does anybody have any questions? Because I'm there must be more people. Can you show the configuration on the shop? I can. I can do that. Yeah. Give me a quick second here to actually pull it up yeah sorry I, I forgot to mention if people don't want to speak just type your questions into the chat sorry so um it's a it's a very very basic Vue.js um client um 
it doesn't do anything special. So the entire OpenID Connect configuration is this. It's uh, basically 15 lines of code. You just uh, say, like you specify the URL where you can find the, the key cloak instance. You provide your client ID. In this case, it's a Vue.js demo app. And the client ID has to be known to the key cloak instance so it knows who's asking. And it has to actually have it in its own database so uh, to know which client uh, wants to access the user data. Because if, if that wasn't the case, everybody could just query your data and you, you don't want that. And yeah, there's a bunch of like redirect URIs, silent renew, like it can fetch data in the background if the tokens expire. It's 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 standard OpenID Connect OAuth, which uh, the internet has been doing for the past, I don't know, five to 10 years maybe. Um, but that's it. So yeah. So everything a shop has to do is replace HTTPS google.com slash users with some key cloak slash auth iota and then get the client id registered and that's it so it's basically it's two lines of code because this is already existing if you have login with google on your on your page you would you would already have this That's so freaking simple. I love it. Um, yeah. Just like going going a bit a bit out of the out of the code sort of side of things. Um, mm -hmm. How easy would it be to to say implement this into say a plugin or um, for for third party like um, composers such as like WordPress or Wix or or something like that. Um, I mean, it totally, I'm, I'm not, I'm not a, a, a WordPress or, or Wix or, or something like that developer. I don't even know how their login system actually works. So if they use the Wix platform to, to get their users, I don't know, like probably not too hard because it's, as I said, it's standard. So if you can actually replace the Wix.com, um, URL. To, to query your user data and, and provide your own, it should be super easy to do that. It, you, I mean, you just need some, some uh, key cloak instance somewhere that runs this, that runs this IO identity plugin. That's it. And I'm planning to, to actually get a hosted version up in the cloud somewhere uh, anytime soon, not making any promises, <laughs> um, but uh, I want to I want to do that and have it as a as a simple to use playground version. I mean the thing is you can actually kill the database of Keycloak at any time. You can you can interchange the the hosting system at all times. As as you've seen before, I I wiped all users and the only thing that happened was that I got locked out and I had to log in again. But since I control my personal data and I sign the credentials, it doesn't matter if the if the central instance here uh, is exchanged or breaks down or you just boot up another one. That's it. Super simple. Um, we we've had another question. Um, yeah. As a member of the public using the shop, exactly yeah. what do they need to do? from the start that is different to currently just a Google login? From the start, uh, depends on if you want to run your own instance or not. No, 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 not, not from the shop, from the public perspective. So I want to log in with my digital identity. Oh, what yeah. do I have to do before I can log in? Um, I mean, you have to you have to have some DID on the Tangle, which is super easy to do if you follow the uh, identity RS instructions um, that you are the holder of, that you have the keys to, that you can sign, that you can sign uh, credentials and presentations to. So 
Um, that's that's standard identity RS, I would say, or standard IOTA identity. And um, I mean, I'm using this this client, this this uh, CLI wallet here, which, as I said, I like I I put this together in like I don't know two days or something. Um, you shouldn't be using this for any for any real use. I mean, I'm gonna open source this as well, so you can play around with it, obviously. But you should really not use this. It doesn't use stronghold. Um, your private keys are not secure in this one. So if you plan to use actual shops with that, I would strongly not advise that. Um, but I think some some identity wallets will will come eventually that are secure. And uh, from from a user's perspective, you just need to have some sort of a wallet that can create uh, verifiable credentials and presentations. That's everything you need to have. So much I mean, in the way. Oh, sorry. Go on. No, it's all right. Um, you 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 pick the the data you want to provide by yourself, right? I mean, the the. Uh, but client can always ask for more. I mean, the client can always say, okay, please log in with IOTA and they can have an intermediary screen that says, please at least give a valid email address or you won't be able to use our page, which is totally uh, legitimate from their perspective because they don't want to people to, maybe they need to authenticate you or something because you want to order stuff that's, that has a legal age restrictions or I don't know. Like maybe they, they, they have a legitimate reason to, to know you more about you. So they can always request more and not accept your credential if it doesn't contain what they need. But you as a user can always deny that and say, okay, I won't sign a credential with my keys, with my data and provide it to you because I don't like giving that to you. But you are the person controlling that. It's yeah. awesome. Like it, it, much in the same way, though, as well. Like when you when you start using Google, you have to create an account. So you have to have like create your email address, put your password in, things like that. But the yeah. only difference is instead of going to the Google website, you've got like client application, whether it's a desktop app or a, a browser integration yeah. or a mobile wallet or whatever. Um, and as soon as you've created your account in this, you can use it for everything. Um, yep. And I think that's incredible. I mean, there are so many, I mean, during development, there were so many possible extensions and stuff that I, that I uh, kind of like that, that popped in my head that you could also, um, for example, um, as I tried to, to, to implement the, the, or, or state before, you can request the deletion of your data uh, during giving it. I mean, as, as you've seen before, like uh, I had this request removal at, and then there was a timestamp. So uh, you can even maybe have GDPR compliant requests for data removal while giving it to them. So you can always say, okay, here's my data, but you have to delete it after a certain amount of time. Because in the current state, and I, and I don't think uh, there's any like technological solution that we're aware of, I mean, you cannot prevent the store from saving your data, right? I mean, you can maybe prevent the the central authentication system from, from storing it, but not the store itself. I mean, they have legal compliance also. Uh, maybe they have to store your order for a year or something so they can always uh, come back uh, and, and, and see who ordered what at what point of time, et cetera. Maybe they have that. So, there's limitations to, to getting your data removed fully, um, which is okay, I think. Still still solves the problem. Well, when you, from, from a GDPR perspective, I mean, this is just, yeah, this is revolutionary. I mean, it's control of your own data. It's what GDPR tries to do, but it's struggling with current technology because obviously everybody has a database. Um, and like, 
this as as an entry point is freaking amazing um but taking a step back obviously we need we need the identity wallet we need like um a desktop wallet or a, an integrated web browser um application or something like that but this 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 can work almost right now um as it is and as an entry point it's freaking amazing but where where do you see this going next like how do you see this advancing into something like universally adopted and just completely insane daniel may i take that one yeah go for it, go for it. Yeah, <laughs> yeah yeah please <laughs> yeah, so um uh, both me and Ike have been uh, looking along as Daniel has been developing this and learning in every step along the way about um, yeah how this system works uh, from Daniel, which is uh, super cool. And um, what we've been doing is preparing a request for proposals as a next step. So what we would like to do is uh, yeah ask the community, but also any companies. Um, in um, not just the IOTA ecosystem, but the self-sovereign identity ecosystem, or even the open ID ecosystem to um, implement this uh, really for uh, production ready. And then we, at the same time during that request, want to link towards Daniel's implementation as a, a strong source of inspiration. And hopefully uh, at that time, the uh, code will also be open source. So that way we really prepare it uh, to be yeah, ready for use uh, anywhere um, uh, at any um, website that uh, wants to adopt it. So what we will do with that request for proposals is request two different types of solutions. Uh, we have dubbed them Web2 and Web3 logins. So what is just shown is Web2, and that's really focused on indeed ease of adoption as Daniel beautifully explained and showcased. This is like super easy to adopt, but it's not perfectly decentral, right? So we still want a solution like that and, and want to fund development of that as an IOTA foundation. Um, but at the same time, we also are looking for a Web3 solution, which is basically where you would cut out the identity provider and the client would have to do a little bit more work in order to understand uh, how the Tangle works and how to log in with that. But we're looking for uh, developers to uh, yeah, fill in the request for proposals in order to build that tooling for the clients as well, such that they can directly inter uh, interact with an identity wallet and the login really basically goes directly between the user and the client uh, with no centralized components such as the identity provider. And if we would then have both, there's basically the ability for a website to either adopt the Web2 login and just you know get started today by just adding the URL of uh, the identity provider, or if they're really committed and think, hey, this stuff uh, is way better for privacy, security, etc., uh, we would love to adopt like the full decentralized version. Uh, then they can start to use that own tooling. So. Um, yeah, we're, we're hopefully posting that RFP relatively soon. Um, I'm hoping, like I'm, I've, I've, I'm, uh, I'm also sending it to Daniel for review to make sure that uh, uh, dimensions that we make towards him are, uh, are correct and that the technology, as I try to explain it, is also correct because in the end, he's the, uh, the expert on this. Um, but yeah, so we really want to take this to the, to the next step. And by the time that this video should be on YouTube, the RFP should also be uh, public. I, I have another question here. Um, so I, I read a lot about this web free authentication with uh, DID, with credentials, and there were also solutions like peer DID, which gives connection between the, the client or the wallet and the server, or in this case, the client. So my question here is, why can we not use the peer DID protocol in order to establish such a secure connection without, without uh, saving the data on a centralized base? 
You, so the, you know the, what I mean? What I mean? Yeah, the peer DID basically is a different implementation than IOTA DID, right? Like they're both implementations of the same standard. So that's exactly what the RFP is basically requesting someone to implement um, such a system as is implemented with peer DID, but instead using IOTA DID. And the difference being that a peer DID is actually, um, I believe, not even uploaded to any distributed ledger, uh, but rather is just a one-on-one -on -one connect, like a, a declaration of identity that is nowhere decentralized, verifiable, or stored. Um, which has its advantages and disadvantages compared to IOTA. But it is exactly the next step, right? To um, yeah, have that same level of implementation of a Web3 login as a peer DID, but then using IOTA identity. I'm guessing that answered the question. <laughs> yes, that it does, yes. Thank you. All I'm going to say is, wow, like we knew when when Daniel started talking about this and started working on this and, and started showing us this, we knew this was a big thing. Um, but having Yele discuss the observations from the IO Foundation, as well as the amazing work that, that they've been following Daniel create, um, it kind of really impact how important this is in the future of like decentralized digital identity on the web um we all know about um the current situation with centralized databases and auth and access and everything's based on facebook login or google login or twitter login or login with discord um but a solution like this is really going to change the world um it's gonna it's gonna put put our data back in our own hands. And um, from observing this, from, from when Daniel started working on this, I have to say, uh, it's been months and months of hard work and an incredible um, achievement so far. And it's only going to get better in time. So <laughs> Daniel, I, I really can't stop saying, wow, because I <laughs> love it. Thanks. <laughs> it's Thanks. you literally changing the face of the world <laughs> right now. <laughs> yeah, well, okay. <laughs> Thanks. I mean you you can look at the code and uh and uh, decide that for yourself. Maybe reconsider it. I don't know. <laughs> yeah. I got yeah, but, I gotta clean it up a little. But, yeah, yeah, but the thing Thanks. is this this yeah. is something that you've taken on yourself. You you've you've yeah, seeing that yeah. this is an issue you understand this technology you've worked with this technology previously and you've seen iota as a solution and you've just taken yeah. it upon yourself to just build this and yeah. that is freaking insane dude um i mean it, it it started with oh you can write plugins for keycloak oh can I make it speak tangle? <laughs> okay, <laughs> it kind of works. <laughs> yeah, but I, 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 I also, yeah, I kind of, I also have to say this is a base version of what I built. Um, I have I have many uh, possible improvements to this. So anybody uh, who wants to to code a little, I mean, Keycloak is Java, so you should probably know a little Java. Um, but I invite everybody to to contribute and to to make it better and to improve it and to test it and to to extend it further, et cetera. Um, I invite everybody, and uh, I would I would love to have more discussions on how how we can make it even better. Yeah. And um, just one question: Are these repos going to be open straight away? Yeah. Uh, but, but probably midweek end of week maybe yeah okay so by the time this video is live these videos should uh these repos should be public yeah yeah or they will be and uh i i also said that i want to like make a short condensed four minute five minute version of this yeah. of this entire talk uh so people have it easier to understand what's going on and um don't have to watch the entire identity meeting Amazing. Dude, you're a freaking legend. 
changing the future with open source technology. All of you are in back. I, I, I literally, I keep, I keep on losing words. I'm like, oh, I, yeah, it, it's just freaking amazing. Um, can't say thank you enough for presenting this today. Um, yeah, is is there any way for people to get in touch with you or just on Discord? Yeah, sure. Disc Discord first, I would say, and then uh, once the repos are public, uh, which won't take that long, so I'm I'm planning to release it this week, uh, and then we can we can keep talking about the code there. Yeah. Sweet. We'll post this all uh, below the video because um, we'll have it over right. there, then, I guess. <laughs> Awesome. Well, thank you very much. An absolutely insane meeting. Um, yeah, I can't, I can't express enough how excited I am for the future of this, um, especially hearing um, the encouragement and support from Yele and the team and the way they're moving forward with it with the IF and also external, because this is important for digital, ident digital identity globally. Um, so yeah, I guess that's the end of um, this meeting. So I just want to thank everybody and yeah, take care.